Tonight, we want to have a talk. Look, we, the truth is that, you know, we were inclined and, and all the ministers have signaled that they're very, very um, willing to come and share information with you all. But we thought that priority for this country, for us, from the viewing public and the listening persons, is health. And so we did invite Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, and he had no hesitation about coming here, um, coming in room 592 to tell you about where we are, what is the, what is the bill of health for this nation? What are we looking at? Is, is this nation, you know, sick? I mean, and, and, you know, we don't want to go into the mental side of things, Minister. But brothers and sisters, the health of our nation, you, you would have all remembered that over the past five months in Room 592 and on elections, what? A lot of persons were calling in, complaining. No medications, pharmaceuticals were missing. People with diabetes could get nothing. People go with pains and cuts and, and all kinds of things to the hospital, and they didn't even have aspirins to give them. So now we can't blame APNU AFC now anymore, right? We have the man who is going to say, if things go wrong, blame me. And so, uh -huh. Minister... Welcome to Room 592, sir. And I will hand over straight to you to tell us what is happening in health. And first of uh, all, what did you find when you opened the door and go in, sir? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Yog. Uh, thank you very much, Leonard. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Oren. Um, I am very happy to be here with you. Um, to perhaps uh, talk to you about some of the things in health. The picture is not pretty, let's put it that way. Because as you said in your introduction, um, a lot of people were calling over the months, uh, complaining about shortages and so forth. And that's what we're finding because now that we have an opportunity to talk to the technical people and to review some of these programs, uh, what we are seeing is that it, it, it's probably far worse than um, what we had anticipated. So for example, um, in terms of medication, uh, most of the medication for chronic, what we call chronic non-communicable diseases, these are things like diabetes and hypertension and heart diseases and so forth. Almost all those drugs um, are in short supply. And in some cases, and in some, um, or some of the items, they have nothing, right? Um, so this, however, I think was masked because, you know, a lot of people, because of COVID-19, uh, they were not going to their health centers regularly. And even those who went, um, in many cases, they were being turned away because the health workers were telling them, well, you know, because of this um, pandemic, we can't see you. And therefore, in, in a lot of ways, this would have masked uh, the true situation. And maybe the few complaints that you had were not really reflective of the magnitude of the problem that we have at hand. Right. And so we have a major um, shortage of drugs and medical supplies in, in, in in the entire system. And that is one of the priorities that we'll have um, to try and see how we can quickly sort that out. Mm -hmm. In terms of, um, you know, the last PVP government would have done quite a lot of work uh, with HIV. Um, we, we, we were able to introduce antiretroviral medication for persons who needed it. Uh, you had tests that were being done in fact, we created things like National Testing Day where thousands of tests were being done on that day. As it is right now, we have a shortage of HIV test kits. Can you imagine that? Wow. HIV test kits are in short supply. Um, ARVs are in short supply. So persons who would have um, been put on these medications they would have difficulty to maintain those regimens. Uh, in terms of TB, for example, another infectious disease that we work very hard to control, um, we have shortages of those medication as well. 
-hmm. So when you look at this situation in, uh, from a point of view of shortages, uh, throughout the system, there are shortages of various items. And I haven't been able so far uh, to look at the actual situation in some of the regions. And you know, um, because of how medicines are distributed, generally in the hinterland areas, you would have uh, problems uh, in terms of taking these uh, medication out in the best of times. So you can understand now, if the entire system has shortages, the kinds of difficulty that must have been, must, must have been taking place in the interior communities. And Minister, I think under the, under the PPP government, you guys would have instituted a robust um, regional health system that I think was, uh, was, was cast aside when the government changed in 2015. Is there any semblance of the kind of, because I know one of the things it served was, was a kind of a roll-up reporting so that you as minister and your CMO and so forth gets a snapshot at, at, at your request of things across the country. Is that, uh, are you finding that still available? Well, we'll have to probably change, change back the system um, to what it was before. But just sticking perhaps with the drugs and medical supplies, when the APNU AFC came into power, one of the things that it did was to allocate uh, to every region a drug budget. Mm -hmm. So basically, if, um, for Region 1, if they were going to give them $100 million to buy uh, drugs and medical supply, uh, they put that in the regional budget. Right. Now, what we were doing, we were putting it in the, under the Ministry of Health so that the Ministry of Health can make bulk purchases. Because mm -hmm. when you buy in bulk, you were able to get better pricing and a whole host of other things. Economies of scale. Now, right. So now one of the difficulty with this new system that they put in place was that you send the money out into the region. The region would take a part of that money and they would buy what might be emergency needs for things that they needed right away. They'll buy a few items at a high cost because they're not benefiting from this um, you know, economy of scale. And then they'll buy back the money to the Ministry of Health, the rest of the money. Right. So basically, you will have a time lag of a couple months uh, because it goes out into the region and from the region come back into the ministry and then they will have to make purchases. So mm -hmm. in the best of times, you had a, a time lag with how the, the, the money was going to circulate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, that is why earlier in their administration, they were having all kinds of hiccups with um, supply of drugs and medical supplies. But right. what I'm discovering, it's far worse than that because um, I suspect for maybe about two years, they actually haven't bought anything. Mm -hmm. So okay. what you have now is nothing was bought for a period of time. I'm trying to get all the details right now so that, that yeah. you know, we, we can get accurate information out to the public. On top of everybody's concern, Minister, as much as you're trying to get a grasp of the, the holistic uh, uh, health situation in the country, on top, of course, of everybody's concern here is COVID-19, because yeah. we here, Leonard and I, on the program, we would have expressed great dissatisfaction with the way information was coming to the people. Um, can you just take us through it, what you have done? Has the, has the last uh, COVID task force been uh, demolished? Uh, is there a replacement? Tell us a little sure. bit what yeah. So a couple of things. The, um, the response mechanism that uh, the APNU FC had was a very bureaucratic and disjointed one. Uh, you had different tiers. So you had something at the office of the president um, that was called a task force. Basically, it was highly political. You had most of the members of the cabinet being part of that task force. Then below them, they had a very extensive um, what you might say, secretariat. But th that secretariat was not fit for purpose because a lot of the people who were in there um, were basically political um, people. I don't know how much they knew about COVID and infectious diseases and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I guess they were put into that um, secretariat 
so that they'll be able to get a big salary. Right. And um, so, for example, one of the persons who were in this secretariat is um, uh, one of the APNU agents who were in the tabulation center. You remember there was a young um, army fella um, uh, who was there on the first day, I think he said I was trying to, um, yeah. <laughs> to, to have yeah. some um, secret um, meetings or something of the sort. So he is one of the persons who are being, was being paid by the secretariat. Now imagine we are paying this man to go do work in COVID. And instead of looking after COVID-19, he came to the tabulation room and sat with the rest of us for 34 days um, observing tabulation. Now, there's nothing wrong with him observing tabulation, but he shouldn't, you know, he should be doing the work that he was paid to do. Right. Obviously, um, the taxpayers of this country was not paying him to go observe, um, you know, elections on behalf of uh, APNU AFC. He could have uh, taken leave and do that on his own time and so on. Nobody would have had a problem with that. So mm -hmm. I'm making that point to say that many of the people who were in the secretariat of this task force were political people. And um, really, they weren't doing anything relating to COVID. They were mm -hmm. probably drawing a salary and doing other uh, types of activities. Right. And you but, have a... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so Leonard and I, we did mention that because, Leonard, you remember we, we, we decried, decried the fact that uh, were polit it was politicians who, who held those titles. Minister, um, is it... I, I hate to bring this up to you, but are you going to have the executive authority like your predecessor are all the test results going to have to come to you first before before the patients know whether they're positive or negative um actually when i when i um uh, took over that system was still in place so i have uh, given very explicit instructions to change that system because I really believe that once the test is done from the lab, we need to do the, the results need to go in three directions. The first one is to go directly to the doctors who are treating so that there's no hesitation. They would know the results and they can take the, the, the measures that they need to take um, mm -hmm. in terms of treatment and care. That's the first set of people who ought to get those results. The second set of people who will be getting those results are the, the unit that is tasked with doing um, contact tracing mm -hmm. because they need timely information if somebody is positive to make contact with them and then to interview them to make sure that we find all of their contacts so that we can trace and make sure we, we, we are on top of this. Okay. Um, and then there's a unit that compiles uh, the cases and so forth. So one of the copies would go to that unit. So it doesn't have to come to me. And I have given those explicit instructions so that people know that this is what you, you need to do. You, you don't have to send results to the minister's office and then the minister would um, disseminate it. That's a total waste of time. We are wasting valuable time. And in the meantime, you can really get it out there to the people who matter and, and make a difference in some cases uh, to the patients who need care. Yes, sir. And so, yes, sir. Then, to remind you that, uh, you know, what, what has been found to have been a bureaucratic process was when tests are conducted, the test results had to go to the minister first. Uh, minister, well, well, you are now the new minister. Um, minister, Dr. Frank Anthony, who is the head of the COVID task force now? The head of, well, it's not called that. We have a policy um, body at the top where the prime minister is chairing. I am on that um, as a co-chair. And we have Dr. Ram Sami who's there. In addition, we have um, Mr. Ramesh Duku who is representing the private sector commission. And we have um, Dr. William Adikro who is from the Pan-American Health Organization. Mm -hmm. 
we have the the resident uh, UN uh, representative uh, on the body, and we have a representative from PARICOM who is also on that body. And the reason why we have blended it, so to speak, with a mixture of government, international bodies, and um, private sector is because each of these um, agencies, if you like, for want of a better word, right. each, each of these uh, stakeholders, um, they bring um, an important component of how we should be responding. So for example, the UN system, they have done a lot of work on socioeconomic impact, uh, looking at vulnerability of population, uh, migrants, and a whole host of other vulnerable people. And we want to have that in our response and when we are crafting policy and so forth. Uh, in terms of CARICOM, COVID, uh, we cannot operate in a vacuum. And our Caribbean neighbors, if we are going to be doing opening up of airports and things like that, we have to do it in tandem with other countries in the region. And therefore, uh, having CARICOM on board uh, is, a, is a very important uh, way of synchronizing what we are doing. And of course, our, our partnership with PAHO. Uh, PAHO right now has been helping us to procure uh, some of the needed supplies. And um, I must tell you that uh, through the Indian government and the World Bank, the Indian government would have donated uh, 1 million US dollars to this response, to Guyana's response. And PAHO um, has those funds and is using it to buy supplies. We also receive $1 million from the World Bank. And from other agencies, there's another 500,000 or so. So right away, we have a pool of fund that PAHO is managing and they are getting critical and needed supplies for us. So you asked me earlier about some of the the quick fixes that we were trying to do. One, um, our testing capacity was quite limited and still is, and we are trying to fix that. Mm -hmm. So um, the machines that we have at the National Reference Lab can probably do maybe about uh, 80 tests or so um, per day. Well, basically when they do one run, they'll run that for a day. We are trying to add more capacity and hopefully I can um, lift that capacity to about 300 tests per day. And that's what uh, one of the things that we are working on. In terms of PCR machines, you would know when we were talking about PCR machines, we were saying we did not have enough. Um, we have two right now at the reference lab. A third PCR machine, and I want you to listen to this very carefully was sent in by the International Atomic Agency for us. And this thing came in and was lying on the wharf while we have a raging pandemic in this country. This piece of vital equipment was sitting on the wharf for an extended period of time. Do we have an idea how long, sir? I, I, would, um, I would get the exact time and let you know. But we have been able to uh, find it, retrieve it, and we have brought it into the lab and we are going to sharply try to put that into operation. So that, that, that surely was one of the casualties of the political impasse, right? right so. Yeah. And um, so one is that, and we have a, 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 a fourth one that is coming in. Mm -hmm. So with these machines, we are going to try to um, scale up our response, but machine alone, it's not going to help us, right? We need technical personnel to be trained. As it is, we only have two persons at the lab who were doing these PCR. And as you can imagine, they have been overworked. So uh, as of this week in collaboration with PAHO, we are going to be training um, medical technologists that exist within the system. And we are extending that collaboration as well to the private sector. So if they have medical technologists that they would like to train, we are hoping that we can train maybe 20 to 30 persons uh, to be able to do PCR testing. PAHO is going to have a consultant out of Washington who is going to be doing this training. So that uh, maybe in another week or so, we'll have a number of other trained persons. Mm -hmm. um, 
test kits. When we got in, the kits we had about maybe about a thousand test kits, which wouldn't have lasted very long. Right. So we have started right away to mobilize more kits. Uh, you would have heard um, during the president's speech that he spoke about um, Barbados making a generous donation to us. So we have gotten a couple of thousands from Barbados. Um, this week, we are expecting about 10,000 more test kits from PAHO. And by the end of the month, we are hoping to have 10,000 test kits, uh, four, 40 more thousand test kits coming in uh, from PAHO. So that would give us a good stock uh, to handle immediately um, and to scale up testing if that needs to be done. Great. So right away, um, one of the major things that we wanted to do was to try to, to scale up the testing response. And this is why you, you would have seen so much concerted effort in this direction. Right. Thank you, Minister. Um, just two questions more on the COVID thing then. One is, are you hoping at any time to start establishing a baseline so that you, you know what would be your numbers there from and how early you would expect to get that done? And of course, the second one is not a question, it's a comment. Um, yes, we heard the, the, the I, we heard President Ali said that you know there'll be more than forty thousand kits available. In addition, a whole set of PPEs are going to come in, and, and you, you're building a robust COVID response all across the country. My question, my second question, one was baseline, and second question then is, are you hoping to to have deployment or test centers around the country, or will you still be centralizing it? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the, the, the things that we have to do, these tests, to do them, you, the laboratory would have to meet certain requirements and certain standards. And some of the labs that we have out in the region uh, would not meet those standards as they are right now. So we have looked at another location where they have a lot of the things in place and um, we are going to be moving some biohazard cabinets into that area and trying to make that one ready as well so um, not just the reference lab but we'll have another location where we can do testing so we are trying to increase it in in that way uh, in terms of having maybe a regional hospital, that we will have to look down the road um, because of all these infrastructure that we have to put in. Now, another, another uh, bottleneck that we'll face is that every time we try to in, in, install a testing cabinet or a biohazard cabinet, uh, we have to certify it. And the certification would have to be done by international um, people. So we'll have to fly somebody into Guyana just to come in to certify these cabinets to say they don't pose a hazard to the staff and so forth. Uh, so that too is one of the, the key yeah. challenges that we are having. Now, yeah. in terms of baseline, well, you would know the, the accumulated numbers that we are having, but once we start testing and testing more, uh, we will see increase in numbers. Right. So one of the things perhaps I want to say to your uh, viewers and listeners, there are regions that we didn't see uh, many cases. That does not mean there aren't cases. All it means is that because we weren't testing, we don't know, right? So once we start um, expanding testing, we will see some of the cases go up, right? And um, right now, we are looking, we are concentrating a lot of our efforts in region nine, eight, and seven, because these are some hotspot areas that we have identified based on our surveillance. And you would know that in Brazil, they're averaging maybe about 56,000 cases per day. Mm -hmm. In the state of Roraima, uh, one of the reports that I've seen, one in every four person 
um, have tested post are, are, are deemed to be positive. Wow. Right? So what you have there is a very high prevalence of COVID-19 in the state of Roraima. And because of the long borders that we have between Guyana and Brazil, um, you can imagine that people are crossing over back and forth mm -hmm. and that can create a lot of problems for us. Right. So um, that's an area that we are looking at. We have to do a lot of education there. We are right now um, developing material in the Amerindian languages uh, so that we can put that on radio. And um, we are trying to get some uh, people who have influence in the community, like the Tushaus and so forth, to work with them so that you know, they can explain uh, to their community the risk that they face uh, and so forth. Great. Well, thank you for that. Interesting, because uh, ladies and gentlemen, please note that we will have 40,000 test cases. As the minister says, when you start to use those 40,000 test kits, you are obviously going to see an increase in the numbers because then you're going to get to the true uh, status of, of how much at yeah. risk people are at, in different parts of the country. Minister, let's talk a little bit about social side of things. So we have seen the seawall gatherings. We have seen the rum shops. We have seen places where people still gather. Now, it is a ticklish thing for your government. Because now coming in government, if you are to clamp down hard, people might want to say, well, it was easier back then. How, how do you guys plan to, to, to get people to, to be conscious and to not well, assemble walls and all over? Well, in my mind, it's not ticklish. Okay. The order that has been in place is still in place. Mm -hmm. Because COVID is not going to make an exception of anybody. Right. There's one, there, there's, we know the ways of how this uh, virus is being transmitted. And if you want to be irresponsible, don't wear a mask, don't keep your distance, don't sanitize your hands and things like that. At some point, you're putting yourself at great risk. And so what we saw on the seawall and, and mm -hmm. the way people are behaving, that is highly irresponsible. So one of the outcomes of what we did there, um, we had a high, very high level meeting this morning. Our Prime Minister chaired the meeting and we met with the army, the police, Minister Ben and um, some of the other key stakeholders. And we spoke about these things. And so hopefully you will see more enforcement. But you don't have to get, I mean, look, this thing here, people got to start being responsible. You don't need a policeman to come and tell you wear your mask properly. You don't need a policeman to come and tell you keep your social distancing. Mm -hmm. By now, people should understand the basics of this disease. And they should be abiding because if not, we are going to get an increase in cases, right? And if you think that um, we don't have problems in Region 4, we do. Because recently we had a case in Georgetown. Uh, we had two cases up on the East Bank. And um, people got to be cautious. Right. Right. So um, I want to use this uh, program to appeal to people to do the right things and to be responsible. I understand um, some bars are opening. They shouldn't be. Right. And, and people have to take this thing seriously because you know what? If they don't, we are going to see an increase in cases. It's simple as that. So Minister, uh, on, on the work side, because remember uh, your government is also keenly interested in looking at how we can stimulate some economic turnover. Yes. So are you, is there any thinking, sorry, that you are going to have inspectors. So for example, at the bank, because the banks or other workplaces, because you, you gotta be interested in the health for the people who are seeking services as well as the service right. provider. So um, one of the things that we have been working on and, and we'll have to do this for almost all the sectors, those that 
uh, would be working? What are the measures that you have to put in place uh, to work safely, right? And um, we, you know, for different industries, different uh, businesses and so forth, there might be slight variance. So we have to put together a lot of those protocols and then we have to explain that uh, to people and get the industries to work with us on it. So for example, I'm just using this as an example. We met, uh, I met this morning with the Guyana Mining um, Association. Mm -hmm. Now they are a key stakeholder in the interior and um, we are going to be finalizing some protocols with them and then we'll put it in place, right? Mm -hmm. So, so far, all the stakeholders that I've met, everybody would like to work with us. Everybody would like to know that they are putting in the right set of protocols and so forth and um, collaborate with us. Uh, so that's one of the things that we are in the process of doing, uh, working with different stakeholders, looking at the particular industry and, and, and see what are the measures that we can put in place so that people can work safely. And Minister, if, if I may, uh, could you tell us, um, uh, based on what you've seen right now, whether it's a good idea or what would be the format under which school would be reopened? Um, we want to hear that from you. Right. So um, we had a technical meeting between um, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education. And that technical group right now is putting together a set of... Um, of things that the education sector would have to meet before it reopens. We in the Ministry of Health, we are laying out some basic minimum standards that we feel uh, schools should put in place before they can reopen. So I, I guess in a short while, give us a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can talk and tell you some of the things that we're looking at, but I don't think that would be fair uh, at this point in time. Uh, but I want to assure you that we are not going to just make that decision very lightly. Mm -hmm. We are going to take a lot of things into consideration because you have to understand that once we reopen school and if we reopen all the schools, we are literally putting maybe about 200,000 children on the road. Most of them would have to use uh, public transportation and a whole host of other things. So unless we can reopen safely, um, then that's something that, you know, we we'll have to look at. Have, mm -hmm. has, has there been any uh, issues raised about the reporting? Every day there was reporting in the past before this administration went in, and there were uh, concerns whether there should not have been more information as to specific areas which were hired at and maybe we give details. What is the thinking of this administration? We are going to, uh, we are right now, um, trying to put together a system where you will have a timely and accurate reporting. But as you would appreciate sometimes, um, the way these tests are collected, mm -hmm. taken to the lab, the time it takes to process, it varies and so forth. So we are trying to, to standardize, and collect information and to be able to give that. Now, while that is going to be done, I know people want all kinds of detail. In some cases, we would be able to release, I would say, information maybe on some general things like regions and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to give you specific um, village and, and which house, I'm not going to do that right. because there's a level of confidentiality too that we have to put in place to respect people's sure. privacy. And we don't want, you know, because easily people can be stigmatized. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a balance between some level of privacy and confidentiality mm -hmm. and um, at the same time, assuaging the public concern to make sure that um, people can get timely information. So it's that balance. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't want to share some of these things, right. mm -hmm. but right. you have to have that that balance. Right. Interesting. And I think one of the things that the country would want to see going forward is regular updates, is yes. regular communication with the people. And I would want to extend an invitation to you, Minister, 
Um, you're welcome on this platform at any time, five minutes, 10 minutes for us to share. Oren wants to interact. Yes, I, I have a perspective. I live in Trinidad and Tobago, as the minister probably knows. And the government, uh, which is being put to the test tonight, one of the things for which they were credited, uh, apart from aggressive pandemic control, is facing up to the Trinidad and Tobago public every day. Every day, the chief medical officer, the prime minister sometimes, but certainly your counterpart, uh, Terence D.L. Singh, every day. And what that served to do was to instill confidence in the population and to clarify certain messages about behaviors and, uh, and policy changes and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a big ask doing it every day, but do, do you see yourself so, um, engaging in that level of communication? So I have discussed this with uh, my senior staff and every day we are gonna either have, I think that has been happening, either the chief medical officer mm -hmm. or the deputy chief medical officer who would normally give uh, the results. But mm -hmm. I have said to them that once a week, I want to have a program, a virtual press conference, so to speak, mm -hmm. where uh, the, the press would be invited. And mm -hmm. I know that you will have all kinds of questions that you want to ask uh, pertaining to COVID. And so we'll have that session where you, once a week at least, uh, you know, we can have an extensive question and answer period where you ask and, and we try to respond as, as best as we can. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm hoping that that would give you enough information. Yeah. Look, the bottom line here, as with any public health crisis, mm -hmm. we need the media as our allies. And mm -hmm. the more you know, the more you would be able to explain that to the public, right? Because we are all in this together. And if uh, you can help us to get that information and to help us to educate people, um, that would be helping with a big part of this job. Indeed, I've said to my media colleagues over here, we, we don't have a side. It's in everybody's interest to beat yeah. this thing. So yeah, right. we, we're not biased one way or the other. We, we all want right. to beat this thing. Yeah. So uh, what are the Thank raw you. numbers as we speak today, Minister? I am trying to get those numbers. I think they probably released them. I don't have them right now. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so, Minister, thank you for that. Um, on a lighter moment, I just want to throw this at you, knowing you're going to have a good laugh here. Is the Turkine um, uh, Liliandal still the, still the epicenter? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> you remember during the recount time that was supposed to have one time been the epicenter, right, for COVID-19? Well, you know the obvious reason, because they were trying to deter people from using the convention center. As it is with some of the silly advice we got about why um, why we should only have 10 concrete center and you should change your mask every 30 minutes and right. all these nonsensical kind of advice. Hopefully right. we, we will get, um, you, you know, we're streamlining the process so that, and this is what I've been saying to my team that look, we have to give professional advice. Mm -hmm. professional health advice. The minute you deviate from that and you, you lo lose the confidence of the public, then we are in bad shape. So every one of the persons who will be going out there, we have to give that kind of, because if we know um, about the disease and transmission and so forth, all of us, we have to talk about these things so that we can help to educate the public, Great. right? And I, and I think that's our approach. We're going to be very open and you will be seeing many more faces because um, we have different people working on different aspects of this. I'm trying to be as inclusive as possible. So I have a team of clinicians who are working on clinical protocols. I have some lab people who are dealing with laboratory um, things. So we are opening up the system. You know, as I said to somebody today, we have a, the Ministry of Health. We have a lot of professional technical people, but if you don't give them leadership and utilize their skills, we are not gonna bring it to bear. And we need to harness that and to, you know, use it 
for the for the um, for the public. Yo, I, I had some questions for the minister, but he hit the ball out of the park every time. I had a question on testing. <laughs> he answered that. I had a question on the border communities. He answered that because I don't know about Suriname, but two of the three countries with whom we share borders, with which we share borders, have very serious uh, but Suriname, to varying Suriname. degrees. Yeah. Well, Venezuela, we don't know because Venezuela has not been giving numbers to the WHO, so we are not it's, sure. What the, the reporting out of Venezuela is that it's bad, but not as bad yeah. as Roraima, four in, four in, four in right. ten, as you and, said, um, but it's bad enough. Yeah, and in Suriname, I think they have about uh, 2,000 cases or something. They had 28. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, we had um, very good meetings with President Santoki and uh, Foreign Minister Ramdin, and um, we are going to follow up at the health level. And hopefully we'll have a closer collaboration in terms of uh, working closely with Suriname, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in terms the, of managing the border. The challenge for us is that our borders are unpoliced. I remember many years ago in the dry season, walking across the Takatu mm -hmm. yeah. uh, into, um, into, into Roraima State. So that, that's yeah. a problem. I think it's yeah, 1,000 it miles. I think it's 1,000 miles you're talking about with the Brazilian border. But, Minister, very quickly, uh, based on what you've seen here, and I know it's, uh, if you could hazard uh, maybe a caution to the people of Guyana, based on what you've seen here, how long uh, should we be strapping in ourselves or buckling up oh, ourselves? Oh, boy. For? There's a simple answer to that. And the simple answer would be that um, until we get an effective vaccine, um, you, we have to be prepared to um, have certain restrictions on movement, on uh, wearing masks and taking these precautions, right? Mm -hmm. When we get an effective vaccine, then uh, we'll have to get access to that vaccine. And then we'll have to be able to um, immunize, so to speak, uh, a high percentage of the population so that we get what is called herd immunity meaning that uh, it would be difficult for transmission to occur. They, they're, you know, internationally what we are seeing, there are quite a few vaccines that are in development. Some are in uh, phase three trials and uh, people are very optimistic. Some people are hoping that this quarter we'll see some of those vaccines um, coming out, being rolled out. And um, once that happens, I think, um, you know, then and, and we are able to access it, then maybe we can relax. What is also very um, good is that through the Gates Foundation, they have been working, working with Gavi and Sepi and some other international bodies. Mm -hmm. And um, Bill Gates, through his foundation, has been able to procure certain uh, vaccination uh, factories, if you like, in India that once we get an effective vaccine, they will be able to scale up the production of it. Mm -hmm. And they have already started contacting countries uh, to, to talk to them about eligibility and how they can participate in, um, in this vaccine program. We have been contacted and we have been um, uh, engaging them. And we hope that, um, you know, as things become clearer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we will also be very much part of that initiative. Yeah. So we, I mean, I want to let you know, we are not leaving any stone unturned. We, we are looking at various aspects, lab, mm -hmm. um, PPEs. We are looking at types of medication, um, what we can do, how we can do it. Uh, we are looking at uh, when the, in the future when vaccine become available, uh, we are already planning for that so that we can have that uh, also in Guyana. So we, we, we are ensuring that all the things that you need to have in the arsenal to fight COVID, that we have it. Great. A, a quick question, if I may, with the indulgence of the two hosts, uh, Minister. The question of behaviors, are people masking up, social distancing and that sort of thing? I notice that the president himself has been setting the example, as did his predecessor, President Granger, with wearing of masks, 
elbow greetings and that sort of thing. But is the message getting through to the general population and are they acting accordingly I, to, to um, your satisfaction? I, no, not to my satisfaction because um, we need to do more mm -hmm. because, you know, I think some people, we, we, we need to educate more. So yeah. here's a good example. Somebody would have on a cloth mask and then they pull it below their nose. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And they're moving around quite comfortably, but the mask is just covering the mouth and the nose is exposed. So we know that that is not going to be effective. They're putting themselves at risk. Right. You have other people who are wearing the mask on the chin. Right? So what is the purpose of the mask then if you're wearing it on your chin? It's an accessory. Yeah. <laughs> and when you look around, you can see many examples of that. Mm -hmm. So we need more education. Right. We need different people to be talking to different constituency, um, educating them about the need to do this, right? And then we can have um, we can have an assessment of risk. So you know, um, if you're in your by by yourself in a room, then the risk is very low. If you're in a room with other people, you know, then you have to take certain precautions. So sure. you have to judge risk. And I don't think uh, people have been doing that very well. And so these are finer points in how we need to educate the public. But masking is one thing, we, we're saying it. And in, in um, health education, there's an interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And that is when you will test people, if we go and conduct a test right now and ask people um, about COVID and you, do you need to wear a mask, all of them will tell you yes right? But tell them to practice it. Or if you have a question how to tease out whether they're practicing it, and then you will see you have a high percentage of knowledge, maybe 98, 99% in knowledge, but you will see that in terms of behavior change and practice, that it's much lower. Right. So sometimes knowledge is not automatically means that you will have behavioral change. Behavioral change come when people internalize the messages that we are trying to get over to them. And I think um, while some amount of awareness was there, we need to now design programs so that people can internalize um, the, the things that we are talking about. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Minister. And I know we did promise you just 30 minutes because you have some other meetings, late night meetings. You have to continue. A lot of planning and work has to be done. Or apologies for keeping you back. I would ask okay. you one final, one final question. And of course, to look forward to your future engagement, sir, because we want to talk to you about procurement and a number of other things within the health ministry. But for now, my, I would ask for your final comments on um, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And just open comments if you can. And, and also your, your closing comments, because I know you have to go. Well, hydroxychloroquine, let's wait a little bit, because I have my clinical team that is working on that. So let's see the guidelines that they'll be putting out. By the end of the week, we should have those guidelines. And um, these are the top medical specialists we have in the, the field. So let's allow them to develop those guidelines and then we can come back and talk to you. Because yeah. once we develop those guidelines um, and everybody is comfortable with them, we'll issue them as national standards. Great. All right. All righty. Well, Minister, thank you so much for being here. And um, on behalf of our population and public, uh, watching public, doing public, we thank you for the information you have shared. We certainly look forward to your weekly press conference on this because we all want to help you um, 